Hello. Hello. Hi. I don't know if you've been in this room before today. I don't mean before today. I mean before, kind of today. But this is the Brexit room. <laughs> and, uh, it's nice that the Union Jack flies. And it's nice that it flies on the first column as well of the whole thing I was given today. So I know where to go. There is another talk going on at the moment that has a Union Jack on it as well in another room. I think of that as Gibraltar. <laughs> as a, a little, little colony. Foxlings, how dare you. <laughs> no, no, this is Europe. Anyway, so hello. I'm going to talk to you about knowledge. I'm speaking to you like this because I have a microphone in my hand. So it brings out the Barry White. Um, here we go. So is knowledge enough? And, oh, come in. Do come in. Bring your tea and your friends. That's good. Thank you. Don't worry. It's all right. You're, you're, you'll be safe here. So is knowledge enough? And the short answer is no. And that's it. <laughs> No, that is it. <laughs> um, that's basically what I came to say. And I'm going to say this with a few slides. I'm going to start with a Dutch slide. Not in Dutch, thank God. <laughs> but, uh, Rob Ruben, could you read that? We're doing a test. <laughs> okay, so we're starting from the premise here that science tells us a lot of things. The objective world tells us a lot of things. But there is another thing going on at the same time. I'll give you a, an idea of this. If science explained the Mona Lisa to us, which it could do, it could tell us the measurements of it. It could even stick electrodes and things on your head and measure the brain and your what, the bits lighting up of your brain when you look at it, things like that. What it doesn't explain at the same time is how you view the Mona Lisa. There is something else going on there, which is your consciousness. I'm sorry to use that term to scientists, by the way. Consciousness of the Mona Lisa how you react and feel about that piece. At this very moment, in your head, there are things going on. Some of you are saying, yes, he's right. My God, isn't that interesting? And some of you are saying, what bullshit? What an idiot, what's he saying? And some of you, da, 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 da. <laughs> got that going on as well. Okay, so that's where we are. And, what I'd like to, this is Mary Midgley, by the way, um, not obviously, it's not her, <laughs> it's her speaking. She uh, died recently, so I think you should be very sad. But she's, she was a wonderful, wonderful philosopher. So, here you go. So what I want to bring to the conversation are various different windows. Yeah. I want to look at education through all the windows, well, a few over there, but left field. You see, I'm a drama teacher. Sorry. This is my theatre. No. Yeah. Um, so I'm talking about the arts. The arts. Yeah. And the arts have their own peculiar way of seeing the world. Then do we discount that? Well, we might do. But not just arts, other things. How do we educate a child in front of us? The knowing, questioning animal. If a child comes to you like this in class, please tell them to leave, by the way. <laughs> because they'd be naked. Do not go into the classroom naked. But the knowing, questioning animal in front of you. Now, some people call this child-centered learning. I, I spit. I spit at child-centered learning. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but there is an element of that where there is a certain element of truth there. There's a certain element of truth there, in that 
you educate the child in front of you, and, and somewhere along the line, they are centered. They are feeling and understanding. It's their job to do that. So there is an element of the relationship between you and the child. I want to unpick that a bit. But the known questioning animal. So here we go. Here's E.D. Hirsch, who's the uh, great doyen of knowledge education. And here he is saying, a knowledge-specific curriculum can impart needed knowledge to overcome the quality of opportunities. Imparting needed knowledge. Okay? And I agree. I agree. But if we treat the needed knowledge and the mind as a computer made of meat, and there are few cognitive scientists who believe that the brain is nothing more, really, than a computer made of meat, what do we do to set knowledge? Again, Mary literally is tiny cover. Now, if we treat the child in front of us as a computer made of meat, then the knowledge is for input, and we wait for them to know it, learn it, memorize it, and then output comes in. And this comes from people like Richard Dawkins here. <coughs> Computers are far the best metaphor for lots of things. We are robot survival machines. He moves away from metaphor quite readily there. We are, we are robot survival machines. And these machines are programmed in advance. Okay, so basically, basically, yeah, and genes are very important, all these things are very important. But if we get a picture of a human being as a computer made in meat, a, a machine made in advance, if you like, programmed in advance, and the teacher then just adds their programming into it, then we seem to be missing out what I would call the human being in the picture. In other words, how many of you, if we take it back in this sort of complete way, if we are completely made in advance, we are, well, you go back to the Big Bang. That's where you're programmed. Everything's caused by what happened in the Big Bang. And then people think this. The Big Bang. So everything you're thinking now, that thought you just had, by the way, that's because of the Big Bang. Okay. So everything's because of the Big Bang. Causing, causing, causing. No, hang on. No, 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 no. I, do, I don't do questions, goodness sake. Nothing like that. No. <laughs> He's the questioning animal. You leave it in your own head, sir. That's where it's based. So, it's potentially reductive here. I've got to come to questions later in other words. So, brain-based learning. So, we could have knowledge. We have memory. We could talk about the input-output. We could even talk about Rosenshine here, and I'm going to mention him in a bit. Programming, instruction, measured outcomes. All those things have perhaps come together. Here is wrote that I don't bother reading this, but he has 10 principles of instruction, Rosenstein, and in an article he actually said, but actually there are 17, and he turned them into 17 principles of instruction. But if you look at those principles of instruction, they make damn good sense if you're teaching someone something that you then want them to be instructed in. Their instruction. Training. The idea that you put something in, something goes on, and something comes out. Input, output. And I was talking to Robert Bjork about this. Robert Bjork, who's a cognitive scientist that works on various things about memory. And he's saying most of the experiments they do are with maths and science departments and teachers. And he said, working with me for a very short time, by the way, was the first time he'd worked with anyone from the arts. And he hardly ever worked with people from the arts side. And that struck me as something quite interesting, because if you're working to put things in in order to create certain outputs, that's very subtly different to perhaps working in a subject which works in a different way. But nothing wrong with those principles at all. Harari talks about marking and uh, assessment and grades. So 
So we've got measurability. The measurable way of knowing something. But we know you know something, and one of the ways we can do that is to evaluate it in certain ways. That you know it because you just repeated it in a certain way or shown that you know something that we've taught you. And that comes out as a grade at the end. So how do we measure success in schools? Well, in England, a lot of it's done through the percentage exam passes, for instance. And teaching is distorted a lot by those things. So here's, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do we expect a lot of this to go on? Teacher. Input. Child knows. Output. Which equals grade or social mobility or social justice that they can suddenly become middle class or something like that. They say. If they've been taught in this way, they know something that comes out in that way. Is that what we are expecting? Well, perhaps we are in some cases in some ways, but I think we're doing more than that. So, instead of the quantity on its own, I'm suggesting we need to think about the qualitative. Instead of the objective on its own, we need to think of a way of embracing the subjective. And in arts, this is about all there is, by the way. Yeah? I mean, you're thinking now, I mean, you're, you're making subjective judgments now. At this very minute. And how, and this is why I stopped him saying it, how do we bring that in? How do we bring these things in? What's going on in your computing, shall we say? Andy Clark, Professor Andy Clark of Edinburgh University, talks about, he's, he's into AI and robotics, really interesting guy, look him up. But uh, he's saying we need to go beyond the computational and move into the idea of the embodied and the situated mind. Cultural and environmental scaffolding. Well, perhaps, but perhaps there's even more. Carlo Rovelli, in the order of time, great physicist. How do we bring in particular perspectives? Would this cyborg see the world differently than you? Would it see the world at all? Does it know anything? Does it feel? Can it feel? If it's programmed to feel, does it feel? How it sees the world, how does that work? There you are, that's a question for you. And I'll allow you to talk to each other about that. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for that discussion. Okay. How would you be if you were a cyborg? Off you go. <laughs> Some of you haven't been switched on yet, I can see. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now, I said a couple of minutes, uh, that was a uh, lie. I actually gave you one minute exactly there. Um, when, when I let people talk amongst themselves, it's always a dangerous moment. There was a friend of mine in the audience um, last year who said, uh, well, the people behind me didn't seem to like it very much at that moment. They said, why? Well, they said, he's talking shit. <laughs> so, there you go. If that's what you said, thank you. Nah, I didn't say anything, you said that, of course. But here we go. Raymond Tallis, who has a red hat. What is it like to be a creature with conscious experiences? We can comprehend how the light comes into the brain, but not how the gaze looks out of it. Not how the gaze looks out of it. You are looking at the screen, you're looking at me, you're looking at the floor, looking at each other, you're feeling the seat underneath you, you've got a pain in the side, you've got an itch, you need to go to loo. All those things are being absorbed into the consciousness, plus your very knowledge you have built up of schemas and things in the past about where you come in on this, and your feelings about it and opinions about it are all there in various different degrees, some of you accepting, some of you not. Pallavi, 
into every act of knowing that enters a passionate contribution of the person knowing what is being known. It's a vital component of your knowledge. The Dhamma talks about understanding as bringing something universal to the particular. It always involves applying what is to be understood to your present situation. You're always pulling it into how you view things. The way I put it, knowledge comes to us imbued by our way of knowing it. What I think we need more of is wisdom and knowledge itself, if you like. Now you could argue, and some people do, that it's the same, it's all knowledge, but let's, let's put these things in. Experience, knowledge, and good judgment. This is from the Oxford English Dictionary, what wisdom is. Experience, knowledge, good judgment. Unspecified time and place. Now pulling those things together, we bring the person in, we bring the human into the picture. And again, in some subjects, this is less necessary than others, but in the arts, it becomes essential. Here's a very complex and incomplete <laughs> drawing what I'm talking about. Input, subjective personal knowledge that's already there, being changed, the intentionality, how you view the person you're looking at, and how you view what they're talking about or what they're showing to you, and the knowledge they're bringing to you. This is constrained by genes, it's situated in body, design, I'm putting Heidegger just for fun. And then, a bit of freedom there, that you're free to think and make judgments in the pursuit of wisdom. Wow, now, is that all true? I don't know. But this brings in the idea of the quality of the knowledge matters. The quality of the knowledge matters. It's not just any old knowledge. If I'm trying to bring all these things together, I am trying to put knowledge into your head which is better than the knowledge you have there already. Yeah? You're stuck there. Let's say you are a fan of, I can't think of anyone modern. <laughs> um, I get to One Direction and sort of give up then. Um, but let's say you're, you're a fan of One Direction, which would be really sad, but there you go. A fan of One Direction, and I'm teaching you the sonnets of Shakespeare. And all you have in your head is the Lyrics of One Direction, you poor, sallow youth. And I'm teaching you this stuff, and your immediate reaction is, don't like it. Don't like it. It's not as good as the lyrics of One Direction. Well, you say, I'm sorry. This is far better than the lyrics of One Direction. This is Shakespeare. Yeah. And you shouldn't have an argument about that. But there reaction to it is very important to that relationship when you're trying to persuade them that these things are better. So Nietzsche talks about perspectives, how we all these truths are going to come together, trying to get an objective view by bringing all these things in. And Zakaria talks about why we study certain subjects. We'll just pick out one or two of those to have a look at. Because if we're talking about a measurable, objective view of education in some ways, and we say, when we listen to great music, we are moved in ways that reason cannot comprehend, how do we justify that on the curriculum? Why are you teaching them that? Well, I, well, I can't comprehend it myself. I'm not sure why we're doing it, but it's Wagner, very good. Yeah? Tristan and Isolde, and that last chord, some of you don't know about the last chord in Tristan and Isolde. But how do we talk about the things we can't put into words? How can we justify those things being on the curriculum? The study of physics and biology to comprehend the mysteries of the universe of human life. Okay, whose knowledge? This is Matthew Arnold. He talks about the best knowledge. And is that white, male, and stain? We're going to question that. Culture, the acquainting ourselves with the best that's been known. Isn't it funny when a, 
the white male and stale guy talks about this stuff to you, about saying, huh, white male and stale stuff. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not white male and stale. Really. Culturally, equating ourselves with the best has been known to say. So, it's going to teach you the best, so here's Shakespeare. But what about? What about Foucault? What about that? What about, um, what about deconstruction? All those things. So do we teach these things without questioning it? What's the best? What do we know is the best? Well, actually, we can know the best, of course, but um, we'll come to that. If culture, which is what Arnold is talking about, functions ultimately to ensure the preservation and continuity of the people, what happens if you are excluded from that story? But there's also the other problem here, because if she does change the culture, is it the culture that it was before? And all the richness, is it still there or is it taken away? I mean, these, these are big questions. Probably not resolvable. <coughs> but a very important point that these are quite complex questions. Um, this is C.L.R. James, who was a philosopher from Caribbean, Trinidad and Tobago, who loved cricket. Loved cricket. And he wrote a book called Beyond the Boundary, and it's a great thing about colonialism and all that, but he says about cricket, when the first team he saw, first time he saw his team, the West Indies, turn up at Lords, the home of English cricket, and they went out there and beat England for the first time. He said they put it in white clothes, but they couldn't take away the colour of our skin. But there you are, the two cultures coming together, the idea of cricket as a colonial ideal for what it was to civilize, civilize the savage. And there he was finding his poetry, his way of expressing himself within that very sport. So, beyond knowledge, qualitative judgments, discrimination, discernment, argument, intuition, opinion, taste, beauty. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. I was looking at all the um, syllabi for GCSE exams for art, and not one of them mentions beauty, which explains everything about modern art. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is beautiful, by the way. This is E. H. Shepherd. That's beauty. That's ugly. That's ugly. That's a balloon, by the way. But can you see? That, you see, look, if you don't understand that that's beautiful and that's kitsch, you can't do art. <laughs> unless you're Jeff Coons. And if you're Jeff Coons, you say, I want to do kitsch art. So you have to have an idea of what the kitsch is in order to do kitsch art. So you have to have an idea of taste and what's acceptable in order to subvert something that's tasteful. As, uh, you know. An artist did a poo in a can, a tin can, and sealed them all. Yeah? And you can buy his art, by the way. He was a sort of Dadaist in the 1900s, 1910s. Now he's making a comment on art, but I can promise you and that art, by the way, is now worth millions. Um, it's not as good as that. Because if you think a poo in a can is worth the poo on the page, if you see what I mean, then I'm getting my poos muddled up here. Right. Okay. But is that, no, is that better than that? What's, how do you discern this, what the original steamboat will really? So is that as good as that? Well, how do we judge it? Well, we're asking you to judge it. We judge it with the knowledge of what we have, but we also want to bring in our experience and truth and beauty. We need to understand these things to come up to some sort of ideal. Okay, do you love that? Interior design. Or do you love that? Quickly, talk to the person next to you, which is your favourite of those two. And you have to choose one. Off you go. Tell me why. Thank <laughs> you.
Okay, right. Now, if you chose the one in the bottom left, you ch did any of you choose the one top left? Put your hands up. Three of you. Oh, 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 a spectrum. A spectrum. <laughs> Did any of you choose the one bottom left? Right. A smattering. Two of them slightly more, slightly more. Okay. The one bottom left belongs to this man. <laughs> Those of you who chose that room have trumpet taste. <laughs> you might as well build a wall. Right. And decorate it like that, of course. Now, that's at the top of Trump Tower. Okay? That's his, his room. There he is. Resplendent in that. The one top left is Versailles. Now that led to the French Revolution, of course, in some way. So you could say that actually Trump's were well, probably better. Well, we don't know what's going to happen yet. We? We'll take our chances. Right, the best one there, best conductor, please. It ain't him. It can't be him. It's like saying Liberace was the best piano player of all time. It's not right, you know. That's Kitsch. You've got to have Kitsch. You've got to understand it as kids. So Simon Rattle wins perhaps that one. Right, best artist. Some of you are getting nationalistic now. <laughs> <laughs> it's Rembrandt, mate. Done. Well, I don't know which one's the best. Top top left, clearly. Best politician? <laughs> <laughs> Most incompetent politician. <laughs> but here we have the teaching by dialectics. Differing views of the same story. And funny enough, the scientists aren't too far behind all of this. This is Daniel Willingham. That's the best picture I could get of him. And structuring a lesson plan around conflict can be a real aid to student learning. Conflict gives a natural progression. Some sort of argument, conflict, dialectic helps. This is Robert Bjork talking about inductive learning. Putting a Monet next to a Picasso, cancerous cell next to a benign one. You start to learn it more because you're seeing what it's not. Let's have a, have a go. Now, describe who, who painted what, try that, but then bear in mind, how do you know that? How do you know that? And how can you pick it out from that? How much knowledge do you need to know to make that judgment? And then move on from there, what are the qualities for each of those? And try to arrive at something, because if you're an art teacher, you have to do this. As an artist, you have to do this. Which painting should I not put on display? Which is the best, which is so, you know, put them in some sort of rank order, okay? With the people around you, off you go. Okay, so, but the, the, the idea here is you teach them alongside each other, not just, right, here's six weeks of Picasso, here's six weeks of Van Gogh. You teach them alongside each other because you can then make more about the differences and what they have in common. You can learn more that way. I'm not saying do this all the time, but it's a way of doing it. It allows for discrimination processes. It's critical to inductive learning. You notice the commonalities and differences beyond sense. So interleaving things, putting them alongside each other. Right. Now, I've got a, an argument from one of the most controversial philosophers of all time who will argue, I will argue with you in a second, about which is the best book there and why. 
Right, can you make it? If you don't know any of them, some of you might have seen a film or a TV series. Some of you might have read half the way through, like I have. Um, but uh, whichever you've done, which is the best book and why? Off you go. Do you hear the sing? I don't you've seen those uh, things on YouTube where people suddenly start singing in the middle of a shopping centre or railway station bits of uh, Lingers or Arnold? But we're going to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> Ling Miz has better tunes, perhaps, you might say, that's what I argue. Um, who, 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 well, let's, should we forget about Vanity Fair? Does anyone want to argue for that? No, no one wants to argue for Vanity Fair, right, that's it. Okay, so it's down to two. Who wants to argue, for, when I say argue, you don't actually have to say anything. Because <laughs> 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 I see some of you might not be voting because of that, it's like, it's like saying you're for Brexit in certain company. Um, who wants to argue for war and peace? Okay. Who wants to argue for the glums? This whole thing's in English, by the way. Two, is that all? Three. Four, five. Okay. So Lake Glums. Lake on oh, that's my word. The Glums. The Miserable. Loses. Okay. I'm Rand. Ayn Rand. Rand. The uh, libertarian, we'll call that. Libertarian philosopher. Who's very controversial. Argues that Les Miserables is the best by far. Because her values, the way of thinking about it, she says, all the characters in War and Peace are buffeted by events. Their whole character is just forced through. They don't make decisions. The social world in which they're in, the war, etc., etc., makes the decisions for them. They just follow what happens. Historical determinism. In Les Miserables, they have free will. The whole novel is about people choosing. It brings a human into the picture. And that's what she says is what she calls romanticism. That's her term for romanticism is that the human volition is central. Now, Ayn Rand is very controversial. I'm not saying that's a good argument. But what I am saying is the knowledge of that fits into your values. That you need to think about the values behind something in order to make the knowledge work, to make sense. And those values are in conflict with other values. So when you have values and meaning in conflict with other values and meaning, a teacher has to bring that into the classroom. I can tell you that Ian Shepherd's drawings are the best, because they are. But I have to put that into a whole background of qualitative seeing and help you to see the way that I think you should see connoisseurship in that case, but also give you the space and the language to argue against me which he wanted to do, perhaps, early on when he put up his hand, but he wasn't ready. <laughs> because I hadn't had my argument then. But the values and meaning behind knowledge that underpins that knowledge is so essential, 
or else we're just treating the kids as computers made of meat. So is knowledge enough? I, I put dot 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 at the end there because it sort of implies it goes on. But I'm going to read it out. Narrative, values, making meaning, pattern recognition, perspective, subjective, truth-seeking, interleave, dialectical, judgmental, discriminating, truth, beauty, all those things, aesthetics, all those things need to come into an education to organise the said knowledge. But then you can argue about it in the great conversations of history, of time, that you find yourself in, and pass it on to your children, and to their children, and their children, and their children as a dialogue, as an argument, as a dialectic. Now, could you look at that? See what you agree with, disagree with, think about. What would you add to the list? What would you take off the list? Or are you an input-output specialist? Which is perfectly all right, don't have to be. Um, well, think about it. So again, I'll talk about it with those around you. So, what we're trying to do, we're looking at the geyser on the cliff there, looking beyond. So, we're, we're taking that on board, this wonderful, wonderful piece of art here, looking at the person looking out. And that's what I'm trying to do, is look at the person looking out. Now, any questions or points or arguments, particularly from materialists? Oh God. <laughs> you see, now he can talk, that's fine. Do you want to use this? Here you go. Do you consider that there is a degree or type of freedom in acknowledging our biological limitation? Our, in fact, our programmed roboticness Yes. <laughs> no, it's, it's very important because we are constrained by our genes, we are constrained by our upbringing, we are constrained by our economic family perhaps, but also community, and also where we are in history, where we are geographically, the environment in which we walk, the body in which we exist in, if you lose one of your senses. By the way, cognitive science, apparently there are 22 to 33 senses, including the sense of balance and things like that. I don't, I don't know if this is true, but yeah. But if you lose your sense of balance, how do you see the world? Very differently than someone who has good balance. Um, if you lose your sight, you see, literally, see the world uh, differently. So, there, you know, you are constrained. Through that constraint, there is creative freedom, because constraints are where freedom comes from. Any more questions? What? You're, you're much, muttering, yeah. muttering at the front here. I think you should speak louder. In the beschränkung zeigt sich der Meister. That's what you were saying. But. <laughs> it's German. It means it's the same as I was saying. That's good. No, I'm just saying slightly different. You don't need creativity. It makes you more creative. The limitations make you more creative. Yeah. So if I give you five or six chords to play, or just throw a guitar at you, it's slightly different. Yeah, it's, it, you're more likely to make the tune if I teach you something. 
try thinking without a language. The language gives you the restriction by which you can think. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know what the time is, by the way, because the clock has stopped working down there. Do tell me if we've finished already. Uh, thank you. So emotions, well, how would you see that? So you can just become very sad or very happy when you look at art. Right, I'm going to cry. Um, yes, your, your emotional response to something is extremely important, which is also why we need an emotional vocabulary to try and discuss how we feel. And by putting things into words helps shape our understanding of the emotional feeling we're feeling. So art, art is the way of describing our emotional selves. That's what it does. It's a subjective way of seeing the world and putting it into some sort of language, which is why the arts are very important in the curriculum. I'm going to say at that point, with a minute left, the minute walks. If you want to get in contact with me, she doesn't, she's out. <coughs> my God! <laughs> That's all right, I was just saying, I said, here's my contact. <laughs> Thanks for that, anyway. Um, here's my contact details if you're interested at all in getting in touch, you may think want to discuss these issues in further detail. Otherwise, thank you for coming to this Brexit room. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.